<laughs> All right, so I guess everybody had too much fun in clinicals yesterday and decided not to come to class today. Um, we're missing, where's, they're all going to walk in late and then I'm going to have to address them on our day. All right, so we are going to finish up neuro today. Um, we have covered everything from strokes and TIAs to head bleeds to head traumas, um, seizures, and brain tumors. So we are going to go through meningitis, encephalitis, and spinal cord injuries. When I get done with the adult content, I will then turn around and look at some of the PEDS content. We'll just kind of highlight, go through some of the PEDS content. Remember, I don't teach the PEDS content. The PEDS content is up in Blackboard um, for in lecture by Ms. Fuller along with the PowerPoints for it. So uh, make sure you are covering PEDS content. It is on the Module C exam. So let's talk about meningitis for a little bit. Meningitis is a inflammation of the meninges that surround the, the brain. So when we have a patient that comes in with meningitis, um, they can have several different, there can be several different types of meningitis. They can have viral meningitis, they can have bacterial meningitis, and they can have fungal meningitis. When they come in, most of them present very similarly when they present to our ER. Uh, it is then with diagnostics that we typically identify the difference in the type of meningitis that they have. Most of your patients are gonna come in with fever and with nuclear rigidity, or that stiffness of the neck is what they will complain with. So I was in my last semester of my master's program and <laughs> had a toddler at the house. My husband's a nurse, works 12 hour shifts. I was working in the ER at the time. And um, I'd gotten off, I guess I'd, I guess I'd worked day shift that, that day. Got off about seven or eight, came to the house, wasn't feeling the best in the world, didn't think anything about it. Uh, my first three years of nursing, I stayed sick. Uh, I, I was exposed to everything under the sun. I stayed sick all the time. And so about midnight, my, um, I was sitting there watching TV, and my husband and my toddler were in bed. And I thought, I'm just not feeling the best in the world. So I went and checked, had checked my temp, and I was running fever. And I thought, OK, well, I've come down with something. I've just gotten it in the ER. There's no telling what it is. I'll brush it off. And then about 1 AM, I was sitting there, and I found myself watching TV holding my neck like this. I felt like my head was going to fall off of my shoulders. So I was just sitting there holding my, my neck, and I thought, OK, that's not right. So you know the nurse and all of us, we decide we're going to start self-diagnosing as we're sitting there. And so I started thinking, OK, I've got a fever, and my neck is stiff, I have meningitis. And so I went to the bedroom, and I woke up my husband, and I went, Johnny. And I got, I said, Johnny. He said, what? I said, I think I have meningitis. He said, Beth, take some Tylenol and go back to bed. <laughs> I said, okay, I'm already taking Tylenol. I'm a nurse. I didn't take Tylenol when I got fever. So I'd already taken my Tylenol. So I went to the living room. I picked up the phone. I called my daddy. And the phone, phone rang once. And my dad says, what's wrong, baby? I said, daddy, I think I have meningitis. He said, okay, I'm putting on my clothes. I'll come get you. Not wait till morning. Did you talk to your husband? You know, there is a nurse in the house. None of that. And so I sat on my front doorsteps. You know, you think about the child that's sitting there waiting on somebody to show up. I'm sitting on my front doorsteps waiting on my dad to show up because I don't want the baby to be woke up. And my dad picks me up. And I walk into the ER, and Dr. Klassen's one of our ER physicians. He's like, what in the hell are you doing here? It's 2 o'clock in the morning, and you got off about six hours ago. I said, I think I have meningitis. He said, OK, tell me why you think you have meningitis. And at this point, I was, I was sensitive to light, I was sensitive to sound, my neck was nice and stiff, and I was running fever. He said, okay, well, symptomatically, there's enough here for us to, to address it. So sure enough, um, a lumbar puncture later, and I have viral meningitis, which, by the way, is self-eliminating. Um, I had viral meningitis. But about 6.30 the next morning, my phone rings. It's my husband. He's like, where are you? I said, I'm in the hospital. I've got meningitis. He's like, oh, do I need to come? 
Like, no. I got taken care of. I'm good now. Um, but I say all of that into they present very similarly. Um, you, they're going to have some sensitivity to light. They're going to have sensitivity to sound, fever. Um, some of them will have nausea and vomiting with it, but usually it is that classic um, nuclear rigidity, that stiffness in the neck that, that you will see. So when we talk about fungal meningitis, we typically see fungal meningitis in patients that are immunocompromised. So patient, AIDS patients, patients that are on immunosuppressant therapy, somebody with rheumatoid arthritis, a cancer patient that's going through treatment. Those are the patients that we will typically see a fungal meningitis in because they're immunosuppressed. Um, again, symptoms are very similar. We diagnose with a lumbar puncture, and then we treat according to what we find with our LPs. Bacterial meningitis, we treat and to prevent bacterial meningitis. We see um, bacterial meningitis in areas of um, high population, usually in dorm rooms, in barracks, in places that we have um, a confined space and a large population. Uh, the uh, meningitis vaccine uh, is given in childhood vaccinations, and then again, before you go off to college, you'll get a meningococcal vaccine um, to prevent bacterial meningitis. We do see a uh, um, mortality rate with bacterial meningitis, about 25% mortality rate with bacterial meningitis. Uh, so a little more aggressive, but again, it presents very similarly. We treat with an LP, or we diagnose with an LP, and then we treat the causative, uh, causative organism. I'm gonna show you a table here in just a second of what the um, cerebral spinal fluid might look like with the different types of meningitis. an LP on a patient, um, a lumbar puncture. Tell me a contraindication to lumbar punctures, first of all. Increased Increase intracranial pressure. We don't do lumbar punctures. Why? Herniation. Because of herniation. Exactly. So what do we do instead? Oh, 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 are thinking that this patient has an increased intracranial pressure, we are actually going to scan them and start treatment before we, before we do a lumbar puncture. We may wait for several days before we do a lumbar puncture on the patient. But we're gonna do a lumbar puncture. We're going to draw off cerebral spinal fluid out of the uh, lumbar part of the spine, and we're going to test that cerebral spinal fluid. And when we test that cerebral spinal fluid, there's several things we're looking at. Looking at. One of them is glucose. With fungal meningitis, your glucose is going to be low. With bacterial meningitis, your glucose is going to be low. But with viral, it will be normal. Now, why is that? Why is it with bacterial and fungal, we will see a low glucose, but with viral, it will be normal? Because what now? Not quite. Come on. It is a food source. The glucose in the CSF fluid is a food source 
for bacteria and fungus. So your glucose will be low because that bacteria or the fungus that is in that CSF fluid is eating the glucose. It's using it as a food source. Proteins. to differentiate one from the other. Your white blood cell count will be elevated in fungal, will be elevated in bacterial. Oh, I was say you got an F there. I, I don't sure know what that means. Right, instead of a, an error. And then in your viral, um, it is uh, normal. No, it's elevated, sorry. It is elevated in your viral. That is all of the way. So when we look at just the CSF fluid itself, um, there's not a whole lot with glucose, protein, and white blood cell counts that just absolutely tell you what is if what type of meningitis is going to be. The big part of that is going to come in your culture. That is where you're going to find out what you're growing. How long does it take for us to get a culture back? Preliminaries in 24? 72 hours to get a culture back. So for the first 72 hours, the first three days, we get a preliminary at 24, but we don't know what this culture is definitively for three days. So of course when it comes back, it would come back positive for a fungus if it was fungal. It would come back negative for your viral, and it would come back positive for a bacteria if it is bacterial meningitis. So how do we treat them? For 72 hours, we may not know the causative organism of this meningitis. So what are we going to do? Broad spectrum. We broad spectrum antibiotics, and we treat them until we get that culture back. A couple of things that we can look at for um, for Diagnostic of meningitis, we can look at a Kern sign. We can also look at a Rabinsky. Um, what we do with both of those is we put tension on the spinal cord and it causes pain. Um, Kerns uh, is where we see a, a, when we flex the neck and we see a stiffening, and Rabinsky is where we bend a leg and straighten it at the knee. Um, we also can use that with disc impairment. So a patient may come in with a bulging disc. A lumbar disc is usually what they come in with. They're complaining of that severe burning down the leg, wraps around the knee and hits the foot or their foot feels like it's on fire. It's usually a bulging disc. If we check a current sign and it's positive unilaterally, one side, then it is typically more indicative of some type of disc bulging or disc of uh, uh, impingement. Whereas if it's positive bilaterally, it's more indicative of meningitis. So you may see the same thing used for both. Let's see if this video will play of it. Let me shut down my PowerPoint. Brzezinski's sign is a sign of meningeal irritation. With the patient supine, place your hand behind the patient's head and lift the head, flexing it toward the chest. If meningeal irritation is present, the maneuver may cause involuntary flexion of the patient's hips and knees. This is a positive Brzezinski sign. Okay, Tom, I'm going to lift your head up. Just relax your neck for me. Again, just that stretching of the spinal cord and you have um, pain with it. And then, Kearns. Kernig's sign is an indication of meningeal irritation. With the patient supine, flex the patient's hip and knee. Then extend the leg at the knee. Back pain and resistance to straightening is a positive Kernig sign. 
When the sign is positive bilaterally, it is even more suggestive of meningeal irritation. Okay, Tom, I'm going to bring your leg up, and I just want you to tell me what you feel as I do this. Back hurts. Okay. This is a positive Kernick sign. So just a quick idea of, of the two. Both can help in your assessment and diagnostic of uh, meningitis. Again, we mentioned that we do have patients that uh, LP may be contraindicated in. Those that we suspect an increased intracranial pressure will cap, do a CAT scan on those patients instead of doing a lumbar puncture on them. Um, and then we will treat them accordingly. You typically broad spectrum for about 72 hours and then we'll move uh, from there. With these patients, we're still going to do neuro checks on them. Um, most of them with meningitis are alert and oriented. Um, some of them may develop some slowness where you ask a question and it takes them a minute to respond. Um, you can have patients that have bacterial meningitis that are, end up on vents and are extremely sick. Those are a, a little less frequent than probably your viral meningitis where it will actually resolve on its own. Um, we do put these patients on seizure precautions. Again, just like strokes, just like uh, brain tumors, all of those patients, these go on seizure precautions as well. Because there is an inflammation of the meninges, they have the potential to have seizures. So we will put them on seizure precautions. Encephalitis. Encephalitis is an inflammation of the brain tissue and the meninges. So you really kind of have to think meningitis, but much worse. These patients can have profound deficits. They are patients that um, will end up on vents, will take them months to recover long-term deficits from the encephalitis. Encephalitis can be viral, bacterial, fungal, and parasitic. So there can be four types of encephalitis. We see encephalitis carried by mosquitoes. Um, and so when we talk or teach about encephalitis, we have to talk about preventing encephalitis. And that really comes from getting rid of stagnant water. Decrease your breeding grounds for mosquitoes. You cut down on the instances of encephalitis. Um, so things like baby pools that have stagnant water in them, flower pots, um, tires, anything that's sitting outdoors that has stagnant water is a breeding ground for mosquitoes. And we want to reduce that um, population, mosquito population, so we cut down on the instances of encephalitis. These patients come in much sicker. These patients will come in seizing with altered mental status, with motor dysfunction, um, they will have, be much more severe, typically, than your patient that has meningitis. I had a friend not too long ago um, whose mother had a tumor removed and ended up with encephalitis as, as a, a bacterial encephalitis as an infection from the tumor removal. Um, she spent almost three months in the ICU on a vent. Um, she was profound deficits with uh, the encephalitis that she had. These patients uh, can lose muscle tone. They can lose um, lots of muscle wasting during this period. Um, so lots of rehab with these patients. Of course, <clears throat> we, try, we talk about prevention, but then we may have to even just start with airway. This patient have an airway? Can they maintain an airway? Are they breathing and breathing appropriately? Remember, breathing three to five times a minute is not appropriate. It's breathing, but not enough. So can they, are they breathing and breathing appropriately? And then we kind of move down the uh, primary survey from there. <coughs> injuries um, is another one that we talk about. When we talk about spinal cord injuries, we really, really have to look at a very specific population. 
We see the majority of our spinal cord injuries in men between the ages of 15 and 35. Um, that is a very unmarried men between the ages of 15 and 35. That's a very specific population. Why is that? Reckless. They're reckless? Okay. That was a great description from a male in the classroom. Yes. Old enough to know better, still too young to care. Uh, hold my beer and watch this. Um, there's lots of sayings that go along with why we see these spinal cord injuries. Um, they're. Do what now? An undeveloped prefrontal. There you go. Um, they um, ha have not figured out that they're living for someone other than themselves yet. Um, because they don't have that attachment. They're not married. They typically don't have children. They are living life to its fullest. Um, typically, speed is involved with that. Um, I hadn't met too many men between the ages of 15 and 35 that didn't like a fast vehicle. Um, I married one of them. I, I got him through 35. He's 46, and he still, um, to this day, would have a Mustang and a motorcycle if we didn't have two kids at the house. Um, as soon as they are gone, I guarantee you that that is on, that is on his retirement plan. Um, but that being said, that's where we typically see the majority of our spinal cord injuries. And because of that, when we talk about the long-term care of these patients, we're going to talk about the depression that goes along with it. Um, and, that, and that is one of the reasons, is because we're talking about typically a very healthy, independent, um, self-sufficient population that goes from living life to its fullest one minute to totally dependent on somebody else to care for them the next. And there is a huge um, psychological component to spinal cord injuries. This is a web, these are both just great websites on spinal cord injuries. Uh, they can be overwhelming, so just be mindful of that. You don't have to look into these for testing purposes, but if you just find spinal cord injuries interesting, those are great websites. So let's talk about how we develop these spinal cord injuries. So we've talked about head traumas, and we talk about head traumas with motor vehicle accidents and then children over the age of one because they're those bobbleheads. Heads are large, necks are weak. Same thing we see um, with head injuries and mechanisms of injuries. We see those same mechanisms with spinal cord injuries. So when we talk about hyperflexion and hyperextension, it's the same thing as the coup contra coup or the um, um, and, and head traumas. So when we see a hyperflexion injury, with a hyperflexion injury, the force um, is in front of the patient, head moves forward, but we have a tear on the posterior longitudinal ligament. So because the head is overflexed, the back of the neck where the posterior longitudinal ligament is, is where the tear occurs, making that neck weak, and then we have an anterior cord injury. We have an injury to the cord. Again, we see a lot of our spinal cord injuries in the C-spine. As a matter of fact, the majority of them are in the C-spine because that is the weakest link. There's not a rib cage, there's not a pelvis, there's nothing protecting the spinal cord um, in that neck except just a few neck muscles. Hyperextension, your force comes from behind the patient. We have a tear in the anterior longitudinal ligament and a cord injury. So again, very much like our coup and contra coup injuries and head injuries, it just depends on where your force is as to what you're going to see in tears of longitudinal ligaments and spinal cord injuries. Axonal loading injuries is another one. Uh, we can see this one anywhere up and down the spine. Um, I had a truck driver several years ago who had been driving a truck for 40 years. He was an older gentleman, been driving for a while, and he had backed up to a dock, and they had unloaded the cargo out of his semi, and he went from the dock and he jumped to the ground to walk to the cab of his truck to get in and pull off. Guess what? He jumped to the ground, somehow landed flat-footed, 
and had a axonal loading injury of his thoracic spine um, instantaneously like that he was a paraplegic. Um, I was coming down the stairs at Christmas, missed the last two stairs because I had decorations in my hand. Um, Miss Jones was standing on a ladder in my living room about the time that I missed the last two steps. Landed flat-footed. I did not twist my ankle, but when I hit the ground flat-footed, caused a compression um, injury at T8. So we see these injuries occur. Um, diving instances, we see those also with diving instances. Um, but essentially what happens is we have that compression of the spine and the vertebrae just disintegrates, uh, moves, breaks off, makes, makes lots of different pieces. And one of those pieces of the vertebrae end up on the spinal cord. We can also have rotational injuries. This is when the head is turned beyond a normal range and we have a injury to the spinal cord. Scene two, both of them were from chiropractors. Um, an over rotation from a chiropractic adjustment and they ended up as quadriplegics. So we can see a rotational injury as well. <coughs> Again, all these are just mechanisms. These are just ways that we can develop these spinal cord injuries. We can have penetrating injuries um, knives, uh, bullets, um, I've seen a nail gun, I've had a fence post, uh, things come through windows of vehicles that we can have those penetrating injuries. But again, that is where we have a foreign object that ends up on the spinal cord. And most often it is usually a bullet or a knife <clears throat> that ends up there. When we talk about injury to the spinal cord, the primary injury is the actual damage to the spinal cord itself. There is a secondary injury. What is that secondary injury? Secondary response. We talked about it with, head, uh, with heads, we've talked about it multiple times. What is that secondary response we see? Swelling. swelling. We see swelling that occurs. And swelling occurs immediately with these patients. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is prevent that swelling to stop um, any further injury that is there. Um, we're seeing them use cooling, where they're cooling these patients really fast to stop swelling. We're using lots of steroids to stop swelling, cold IV fluids. Um, there's lots going on right now in, in, with spinal cords in treating before the patient ever gets to the hospital to slow down some of that secondary response, some of that swelling that these patients are having. Um, several years ago, it was football season and I was watching a Rutgers game and there was a player who got hit on the field, it was not an unusually hard hit, um, but live TV and as the guy falls, my heart sank because he fell in this odd position and you knew instantaneously that he had a spinal cord injury. And it wasn't but about 10 seconds later, they cut away to a commercial. And so here, now we gotta have this discussion. My husband and I are in the living room having this discussion about what has just happened to this guy on the field. And I'm like, his neck's broke. He is not breathing. There is something wrong with him. Like, I felt like I needed to fly to wherever he was and take care of this guy. Um, sure enough, come back from commercial and they're doing CPR on the guy on the field. Why? He had a T3, no, a C3 spinal cord injury from the hit, and when he dropped, of course, he had no respiratory drive. He quit breathing, and by the time they got him rolled over and could assess him, he had gone from respiratory arrest to cardiac arrest. Um, and they coded him on the field. He was actually out in, Cal I think he was in California, and they cooled him down in an ambulance in transport, uh, took him to the OR, fixed his spine, and he is now a motivational speaker um, about overcoming obstacles in life. He has a wheelchair that will stand him up. His wheelchair has his vent on it. He is still vent dependent because his spinal cord injury is so high. And his speech pattern has changed. 
you don't think about it, about breathing when you're talking um, until you are dependent on that vent to, to breathe for you. So his speech pattern has changed, but he's very interesting to listen to um, since his spinal cord injury. But they're doing lots in the way of cutting down on the swelling that is occurring with these patients so that we are not um, seeing more extensive injuries. Several years ago, before seat belts, the push for seat belts and airbags, almost all spinal cord injuries were complete injuries. Meaning they had no level of function, they had no sensation, they had nothing below the level of the, of the injury. Since we have implemented seat belts and airbags, almost all of our spinal cord injuries now are incomplete injuries meaning that the patient still has some level of function below the level of lesion. Uh, these patients may still have feeling, they can still have movement below the level of the, of the injury. So we have gone from complete injuries, the majority of them being complete injuries, to the majority of them now being incomplete injuries. Our quads versus our paraplegic, um, your quadriplegic, it affects all four extremities. We see quadriplegics with our C-spine injuries paraplegics with um, our thoracic and below affecting typically the legs. We will talk about one instance where arms are affected more than legs. So the different types of incomplete injuries are right here. We have an anterior cord syndrome, we have posterior cord syndrome, we have brown sequad, and we have central cord syndrome. And we actually have a patient we're taking care of right now that's got central cord syndrome. Um, so, we have these four different types of incomplete injuries. When spinal shock is also um, a concern for these patients. When a patient has spinal shock, they have a loss of muscle tone and reflexes. As a patient, the swelling subsides what we will see is a return of the muscle tone and we'll see a return of reflexes. Now, they may be an abnormal reflex. They may not be appropriate, but we'll start seeing a return of the reflex. Oh, let me go back for just a second. Here, I thought they were listed out for you, but they're not. So let's talk about anterior cord. Anterior cord, remember an incomplete injury. It is the front of the cord that is injured, anterior. These patients have a loss of motor function, a loss of pain sensation, and a loss of temperature below the level of the lesion. But they retain positioning sense. So somebody tell me what positioning sense is. Do it now? Okay, what it says? Their position as in? Yes, so they know where their body is located. So if you close your eyes, you're sitting here, you still know that your hands are on the table, your feet are on the ground, you still have an idea of where your body is in this space. With spinal cord injuries, if they lose that positioning sense, they can't tell you where anything is. Um, so these patients retain positioning sense, a pressure sensation, and vibrations. So if you're going to assess a patient that has an anterior cord injury, and you're gonna take something sharp and you push at the bottom of their foot, are they going to feel it with anterior cord if it's sharp? No, they're not. They lose pain sensation, right? But if you go down there and you squeeze their feet or you squeeze their ankle or you squeeze their calf, will they feel it? Yes, because they retain pressure sensation. So you have to understand what type of cord injury they have to do an assessment on them. Because if I just walk in and I, and I take my pen and I push my pen in the bottom of their foot and they don't feel it, 
No, they don't have any, any sensation. Well, they may. It just may not be pain. It may be pressure that they feel. So you've got to change up what you're using in um, checking for sensations. Opposite of your anterior cord is your posterior cord syndrome. Posterior cord syndrome lose positioning sense, pressure, and vibration, but guess what they retain? Movement, pain, and temperature sensations. So here we are, we're talking about a patient that can be a quadriplegic with a posterior cord injury and still move their extremities. Now, they're typically still very weak in that movement, but they will have some type of movement with the posterior cord. Brown to quad is left and right. So on the side of the injury, the patient with a brown to quad injury, loses their muscle movement. On the side of the injury, they lose movement, pain and temperature, movement on the side of the injury, they lose pain and temperature opposite of the injury. So brown to quiet. The injury is on the right side of the cord. They lose movement on the right side. They lose pain and temperature sensation on the opposite side. Central cord syndrome is where the patient will have more profound deficits in the upper extremities than in the lower extremities. So a patient with central cord syndrome may have a C-spine injury and they're able to move their feet and not move their arms. So they'll have a more profound deficit in their upper extremities than in their lower extremities. So all very much just definition based. We'll show you this quick video. This is um, Marcy, and she talks fast, but just listen. She kind of goes through the levels of the spinal cord injury and what kind of function the patient may have at those different levels, how independent they can be at those, at those levels. Hi, I'm Marcy from BrainSpinalCord.org. Today I'll be bringing you some information on the levels of function in spinal cord injury. Be sure to check the website for all relevant links and recap of this article. If you or a loved one has sustained a spinal cord injury, you've most likely heard the doctor or medical team classify the injury with a letter or number, such as C4 or T2. What do those letters and numbers mean? These letters and numbers refer to the levels of function a spinal cord injury survivor has after the injury. Before I get into the specific levels of function, I'd like to go over how the human spinal cord works as well as the impact of spinal cord injuries. The human spinal cord acts as the conduit between the brain and the rest of the body, relaying messages. When the spinal cord is bruised, crushed, or torn, the messages sent between the brain and the body no longer flow through the damaged area of the spinal cord. What does this mean? It means that the functions of the body located above the point of injury will continue to operate normally while the functions below the point of injury will suffer some degree of impairment, including motor deficit, sensory deficit, bowel and bladder dysfunction, and respiratory difficulties. The letters and numbers that doctors refer to after a spinal cord injury are used to identify where along the spinal cord the injury occurred. The higher the point of injury, the greater the impairment. C-level injuries occur in the cervical area of the spine. An injury that occurs in the C1 to C3 area results in limited movement of the head and neck only, with paralysis below that region. In many cases, the survivors of C1 to C3 injuries have difficulty talking and require the use of a ventilator to breathe. Survivors with C3 to C4 injuries have head and neck movement, as well as some limited shoulder movement, 
they're typically able to talk and can eventually adjust to breathing without a ventilator. Those with C5 level injuries generally have head, neck, and shoulder control and can bend the elbows and rotate their hands. At this level, self-care is manageable. Survivors with this level of injury can often push their own wheelchair and driving is frequently possible with adaptive equipment. A C6 level injury results in movement of the head, neck, shoulders, arms, and wrists, including the ability to bend the elbows, extend the wrist, and rotate the palms. The population who falls into this category is generally able to perform most self-care duties, can perform light housekeeping, and can manage a manual wheelchair. Those with C7 injuries have similar abilities as those with C6 injuries, but can manage more easily. Injuries that occur at the T level of the spinal cord occur in the thoracic region of the spine. If you or a loved one has been diagnosed with a C8 to T1 level injury, in addition to the use of the head, neck, shoulders, arms, and hands, the fingers will also be able to be used. Survivors with injuries in this range are generally able to live independently. Survivors with T2 to T6 have normal function in the upper body, but have some degree of impairment in the legs. Some can walk with assistive devices, and those with T7 to T12 level injuries have similar function with slightly more control. L level injuries occur in the lumbar region of the spine, and survivors generally have some ability to move the hips and knees. With this type of injury, walking is often possible with assistive devices. This concludes our segment on the level of function in spinal cord injury. Remember to check our website for the most up-to-date information, including resources and tips regarding brain and spinal cord injuries. And thanks again for watching. So just kind of a quick overview of function based off of the area um, that they have the injury. When these patients arrive, of course, priority is airway. We don't know where their spinal cord injury might be, so it is airway. And if we're opening an airway, how are we doing it? Jaw thrust versus the head tilt chin lift. Exactly. So we're going to have an air, we're going to make sure that they have an airway, that they're breathing, and that they have a pulse. If they don't have any of those, that's where we I mean, we start there. Um, and then from there, we move to the neurological assessment of the patient. We move to um, can they what can they move? What extremities do they have function in? Can they feel? And most of the time, these patients, right after a, a wreck or wherever they're coming from with spinal cord injury, they have a very odd position to them. Um, they don't have they don't have control, so they don't just lay there like you and I would lay there. They're in funky positions. They have a very um, almost spastic uh, look to them because they don't have any control over extremities when they have those high spinal cord injuries. Um, but then we look at motor function, uh, what they feel, what they don't feel, are they alert, are they oriented, what kind of pupil response do we have, we look at that neurological assessment of the patient. I keep saying one day I'm going to buy a pointer that, or a clicker that works, so I'll walk up here. When we are assessing these patients, um, specifically with spinal cord injuries that's a little different than our other neuro patients is bowel and bladder function. Why bowel and bladder function? We just had simulation on this. Why do we check bowel and bladder function on the spinal cord injury? Autonomic dysreflexia. That's right. T6 or higher, they can have autonomic dysreflexia. So we have to know their bowel and bladder training schedule. The last time that they used it, we've got to make sure Foley catheters are patent. We've got to make sure that they're not impacted because they can have autonomic dysreflexia. So outside of all of our other neuro patients, that is specific to our spinal cord injuries. Now, these patients will have muscle wasting. Um, they will also have tendons that will turn into bone because they're not being used. It's that, high, um, that heterotrophic ossification. The problem with that is what does that do to mobility? Decreases, Decreases mobility, which in turn sets them up for ultimately infection. Um, by the way, pneumonia is the number one killer of patients with spinal cord injuries, infection. Especially with C-spine injuries. Why with C-spine injuries? 
That's right. They have very weak respiratory muscles. They may not have that respiratory drive. They may be vent dependent. They have very weak coughs. They can't cough up secretions. They may have poor control of swallowing. And so they tend to aspirate very easily. Um, we can do things like quad assisted coughing. Do you remember reading that in the scenario in simulation about a quad assist cough? What is a quad assist cough? How do we, what do we do? These patients have weak diaphragms, they have weak chest muscles, and they're trying to get something up and they can't get it up because they can't cough. Okay. We, mm -mm. we take the palms of our hands and we put them at the diaphragm, almost like you were doing a Heimlich maneuver on the patient, but while they're coughing, you're pushing up on the diaphragm. That's a quad assist cough. And so you can almost put, like, almost like a Heimlich maneuver, but not quite as hard. You're pushing up on that diaphragm. What that's doing is that's creating um, a stronger cough for the patient. If the patient has any movement of the upper extremities, we will teach them how to, uh, to quad assist cough themselves. They don't have to have great hand control, but if they just have that gross motor that they can get their arms around themselves, just putting that arm under their diaphragm and coughing will increase the um, forcefulness of their cough. So we'll do things like teach quad assisted cough. We have got to do passive range of motion on these patients if they have no movement. We've got to keep them mobile, um, not we got to keep them flexible, let's probably put it that way, so that we can care for them, so that we can keep them clean, we can cut down on skin breakdown, we can cut down on infection by um, keeping them mobile um, with passive range of motion. These patients can have some um, complications of bradycardia and hypotension. That is neurogenic shock when we see that which is different than spinal shock. So don't get spinal shock and neurogenic shock confused. Spinal shock, they have a loss of reflexes and um, muscle tone. Neurogenic shock, which you can see in the same patient, but it's not the same thing. Neurogenic shock, we can see massive vasodilation on the patient, which causes the hypotension. They can develop bradycardia. We have to treat these patients, atropine, um, vasopressin, we'll use all kinds of drugs on them if they are in cardi uh, neurogenic shock, not spinal shock. So there's two they're different things, don't get them confused. Medications, we use um, all different kinds of medications. Steroids is a big one that we use. Muscle relaxers, Xanaflex, um, Baclofen we'll use as well. Uh, with these patients that have spinal cord injuries. We also have to stabilize that C, uh, the spine. So there's several ways that we can do that. When the patient initially comes in with a spinal cord injury, we will put them in, uh, if it's a C-spine injury, which the majority of them are, cervical traction. So has anybody used Buck's traction for a broke femur? These little hip, these legs that come and break their hips and do it now? It is the weights, where we essentially hang the weight off the end of the bed, we fatigue out the quad muscles, and it provides pain relief, but it also keeps that leg aligned. Well, same thing with cervical contraction. We use garden wells, tongs, um, and we'll put tongs on the side of the head, and we wrap them onto the head, essentially, and we then take those tongs and run weights off of them and hang the weight off of the head of the bed and it extends out the neck. Basically, you can keep that um, cervical spine in alignment. Uh, so we'll, we'll align their C-spine and keep them immobile like that until we can take them to the OR. Once they go to the OR, then they'll use plates and screws to stabilize the, C, uh, the spine wherever it is broke. You can see things like uh, these herring rods used. We also see herring rods used in uh, Teenage girls is the majority of them that have scoliosis. So they've developed scoliosis and that's usually a big summer surgery. They do those at the beginning of the summer so they don't miss a lot of school. Um, and they'll put these herring rods in. Essentially the herring rods run up and down each side of the spine. 
it's a big surgery, but we can use herring rods for spinal cord injuries as well. Up at the top, you see a halo. I don't see a ton of halos anymore. I almost took halos off my PowerPoints. And then last year, I was walking in Walmart, and guess what? I saw a patient with a halo. I'm like, damn, I'm gonna have to leave halos on here. We don't use halos a whole lot. Every once in a blue moon, you'll see a halo. There's lots of problems with halos. Compliance is the biggest problem with the halo. So with the halo, what they are, and we have lots of skin breakdown with them. It's the vest. The vest is locked onto the patient. It is fitted and locked onto the patient. They then put the bolts into the skull and it is held in that frame. So this frame right here has bolts that run through it and they attach to the skull. The whole purpose of, of that is to keep the C-spine from moving. We used to have a patient that would come in who had um, unlocked his vest, essentially, because it got tight on him, and so he didn't like wearing it. And so the vest would move. And I thought, what good is that vest doing you? It's doing no good if the vest moves because then there's no stabilization of the C-spine. We also have patients that would get infections at the pin sites because they wouldn't do pin care the way that they were supposed to and clean those pins. So they would end up with um, osteomyelitis of the skull, which is not great. Um, so pin care is another one. We don't see a lot of halos used. The majority of them now go to the OR. We, we fix them in surgery, and it's permanent. We don't have to worry about these halos. Have you seen a halo in years? Yeah. It's been a while. And then like last year, it went and ruined it for me. Um, when we talk about long-term care, I mentioned the quad assist and coughing for these patients. Um, preventing infection. Some of the infections that we see, we mentioned pneumonia um, is one of those that we can see with these patients. Uh, they can also develop PEs. So we have to be mindful of those. Again, elimination is very important for the patient with a, with a spinal cord injury. Knowing their bowel, bowel um, habits, knowing their uh, bladder function. And by the way, most of these patients, long-term spinal cord injury patients, they don't keep Foley catheters. Um, we use urostomies on them. We essentially just take the ureter, bring it to the abdominal wall, and uh, have a bag at the abdominal wall. Long-term use of Foley catheters causes erosion of the um, urethra, causes infections, they get clogged up, there's lots of sediment in the, uh, that develops in the bladder. Because if you think about it, you and I hold urine 8 to 12 to 16 hours some days, right? We go to the, back, the restroom and there is a forceful urine flow that flushes the bladder. Well, these patients don't have that muscle, they don't have that um, expansion of the bladder and then that forceful contraction that causes um, a forceful urine flow, so they have sediment that kind of just builds up um, in the bladder. And so with Foley catheters, if we use Foley's the whole time, that sediment would keep those Foley catheters blocked. They would never um, have a patent Foley catheter. So we use urostomies on these patients long term. Again, positioning, they're totally dependent on somebody else to position them. So we have to be mindful of that with skin breakdown, making sure that they are uh, moved, that we are protecting bony prominences. They typically end up with bed sores all over them, um, sacral ulcers. Um, they're actually, it's very sad to see a lot of these spinal cord injury patients come back into the hospital. And then we have to talk about the emotional side of spinal cord injuries. So we talked about a very independent person who is now totally dependent on someone else to care for them. That is a loss. There is a grieving process that occurs. Um, psychologically, it is huge for these patients. When we talk about 4D syndrome, we're talking about dependency, depression, drug addiction, and if they are married, divorced. Why do you think they end up in divorce? Because they're mad as hell and they take it out on the closest person to them or the only person that's coming in the room to take care of them and that's usually a significant other. 
You'll get questions about sexuality. You'll get questions about sexual function. Am I ever going to have sex again? Um, we really don't know. It's early in the game. We'll have urology consult you on that. But until we know what the true level of your function is, we really don't know if you'll have sexual function again. That's a big concern. Um, they'll ask. You just have to address it. You can't ignore the question. You can't go, oh, no, they weren't talking to me. Um, you, have to, you have to address um, sexual function as well with these patients. Um, they'll also, yes. What do statistics say about it, though, in regards to the sexual function? It really depends on where the spinal cord injury is. Now with penile prosthesis and pumps, um, many of these patients do have sexual function. It's artificially affected, but they do have function. Um, another big one is embarrassment because they will have erections that they can't control. And so um, you'll walk in the room, you'll literally move a sheet, and they'll develop an erection. They're absolutely humiliated and embarrassed. You have to remind them that that is far, part of a spinal cord injury, that you're not offended by it, and, and you really just leave it alone. Like, it will go away. You don't, you don't make a big deal out of it. Uh, it really, you do your job, you get in there and you bathe them, and you take care of them. You cannot be offended when they develop an erection because you're touching them. That is um, something that they can't control because of the spinal cord injury. So don't be surprised if you have, have, have patients that that happens with. You just have to move on. They'll apologize. They'll tell you, I'm so sorry. And you go, look, you, ha you have a spinal cord injury. I understand. And, and you leave it at that, and you move on. But we do have to address the, um, the sexual part of um, their being. I know I had a, a he was like 17, mm -hmm. and I shot a victim or whatever, and that was his first question. Was, will he, have, will he have, ever have sex again? It's a, it's a big concern. I mean, I'm female, 13, well, I'm not 35 anymore, but that would be a concern for me as well. So we, we still have to address that with these patients. We can't just, and, and they won't typically come out and ask somebody of the opposite sex, though. So that's the funny thing. They probably asked Quan because he was male. He probably had not addressed that with another a female nurse that had walked into the room. Um, so don't be surprised if you don't get caught with questions that you weren't expecting with these spinal cord injury patients. Um, does it take a while for it to like click? Because I know he just kept saying, hey, man, help me to the bathroom, man. Denial. Mm -hmm. So remember your phases of grief. There is bargaining, there's denial, there's they're mad. Remember that they will go through these phases of he was in denial, absolutely denial, which is very early. Remember, in a in a grieving process, what that's this can't be happening. It's not me. This isn't real. Those denials that is very early. So we have to address the the grief of that. And so, yeah, he's absolutely in denial because he still mentally thinks he's going to get up and walk to the bathroom. And his body's not going to do that. Um, and once they realize that their body is not going to do that, and this is where they are, there is deep depression. Um, many of these patients, if they could, would kill themselves. Many of them try to convince somebody to kill them or overdose them or leave their medicines where they can get them. They would commit suicide if, um, if they had the means to do it um, because they just hit that that dark spot from um, realizing that this is now their, their life. By the way, lifespan of patients with spinal cord injuries, much shorter, like drastically cut. Most of these patients don't live out of their 30s with young spinal cord injuries, 30s to 40s, they die of infection. They die of um, typically pneumonia, but it's usually respiratory, especially with your C-spine injuries. Long-term care, long-term care is, uh, is expensive and expansive, and again, it is long-term. Um, you have families that think that they can take these patients home and that they can care for them, and in some instances, they do very, they do okay. Um, that is few and far between. Um, the guilt usually applies. Mama is usually still alive, and if it were my child I'd probably do the same thing I'd take them home and I'd care for them being a nurse we would probably get a little further than most people do 
Um, but family wants to take them home. They don't want to put them in a long-term care facility. They want to take them home and care for them. And then months into caring for them, they realize it's overwhelming. Um, and then at that point, they have come in with bed sores. They come in with pneumonia. They're really being taken care of. So please don't judge families when these spinal cord injury patients come in with these wounds and infections. That is part of, unfortunately, part of it, and it is almost impossible to keep them from getting some type of skin breakdown. They have massive muscle wasting. They are, have bony prominences. They are laying all the time um, unless you can get them just specialized equipment like a wheelchair that you can strap them in and they will stand up or standing devices or um, some of those things. But um, family will get overwhelmed six months, a year into it, and then now you're treating mom who's feeling guilty because the child's back into the hospital with an infection. They could have done more. I should have been better. And you're talking about a, a patient, uh, a family member that may be in their 50s and 60s, maybe getting on later in life, and they can't physically move them. So we have to look for, um, many times, long-term care for them. If not, any type of resource to help them move them at home. Um, if it's some type of lift, if it's some type of chair that they can put them in, anything to get them out of that bed-bound position uh, will cut down on some of those bed sores and infections that we see. All right, so that covers um, spinal cord injuries on the adult patient covers neuro for adults. Let's look at some of the neuro for peds. Now, I'm gonna tell you, I'm not a, a peds nurse, and it is up, but we're gonna, we're gonna flip through some of this. This is all I have, by the way. I don't even have it up, and I don't even have it in PowerPoint. It's in Blackboard. So, when we look at peds, uh, a lot of this is very similar. So let's talk about the things that are different. Is meningitis different in a peds patient than it is in an adult patient? No, it's meningitis. Encephalitis, is it different in the peds patient than in the adult patient? No. Seizures are the same thing. We're not covering any of those. Those can all happen to children, but we cover them the same way. Let's talk about things we see in peds that we don't see in adults, um, or we haven't talked about with the adults. Um, neural two defects. Got to look at those. Got to see why we have some of these um, neurological deficits in pediatric patients. What we can do to prevent those deficits. What's a big one? Folic acid. Folic acid. If you've ever been pregnant, you, folic acid, the acid has been shoved down your throat from the time you decided to conceive until you delivered the baby because of uh, neural tube defects. So folic acid is a big one. Even before pregnancy, and I, I'm sure Dr. Godwin has talked that into your heads as well. Another one that we see in pediatric patients um, that we haven't talked about in adults, but I guess we can't see it, is spinal bifida. Lots of different types of spinal bifida. Um, myelomeningocils, we haven't talked about those, but when we talk about myelomeningocils, we talk about spinal bifida, what are we talking about? Do it now. Mm, no, not, not quite. It's the opening of the spinal column. And so we have the spinal cord to some extent that leaves that spinal column. And there's varying um, degrees of that. There's different uh, forms of it. But essentially, we have part of that spinal cord outside of the spinal column and the protection of the vertebrae. These kids are, uh, if we identify a myelomeningocele during pregnancy, they will not have a vaginal delivery. We will C-section that, that patient to hopefully cut down on the trauma of that spinal cord. Um, that baby lays prone, and then we, they'll repair that um, myelomeningocele. It has to be covered typically with a moist dressing, it has to be sterile. Um, some of them have the skin over them, some of them don't. So again, there's severities of that that uh, we see. 
but they typically have some type of deficit from that point um, down. She's got lots of pictures in the PowerPoints of different myelomeningocils. Um, Several of them, I don't know how yours lay out, but mine's on page 15. There's a diagram where you actually see the nerves and the spinal fluid still in that skin sac, but outside the spinal cord or outside the vertebrae. They can, they can occur anywhere on the spinal cord. This one, and this picture's in your notes somewhere, but this is a myelomeningocele, but it is ruptured. So what is the risk of this when it ruptures? Infection, exactly. So no, it's no longer protected with the cerebral spinal fluid. It's no longer that bulge. It kind of looks like a deflated balloon. That is, we now have an infection risk with those patients. Remember positioning, they're, they're going to lay prone um, when, because they can't be on that myelomeningocele. They can't be on that exposed nerve tissue. Hydrocephalus, we actually kind of mentioned hydrocephalus in the adult patient. We talked about hydrocephalus, that overproduction of cerebral spinal fluid. We talked about it um, as a secondary response to a primary injury in the adult patient. Children can have hydrocephalus um, where it's, there's not a trauma, but they just have that overproduction of CSF fluid. Um, we usually identify that by head circumference. That's why we measure their heads all the time is their heads get large and we identify that with the um, head circumference. Why can we do it with the head circumference of a pediatric patient and not the adult patient? Because we ha don't have um, sutures that have f formed, their suture lines are still open, so that head will expand. Whereas the adult patient, remember those, those sutures have fused and so we don't have that expansion of the skull. <coughs> Children that have hydrocephalus, we put shunts in. Where essentially it goes from a ventricle of the brain, it's a tube and it runs down the neck and into the stomach. And basically it just allows for the drainage of that overproduction of CSF fluid. So we have to make sure shunts are patent. So how do we know if a shunt's patent? Okay, so their head circumference hadn't changed. It's, it's down and it hadn't changed. How else do we know if their uh, shunt's patent? If an adult has an increased intracranial pressure, what do we identify first? A change in level of consciousness, an altered mental status, right? Same thing with pediatric patients. The shunt's not functioning, guess what? Intracranial pressure rises and they get they get fussy. They cry. They don't. They're not consolable. They get irritated. We're going to have that um, a change in their normal demeanor with a non-functioning shunt. There's another way that we can check for shunt function as well. We actually just feel it. The shunts should be soft and pliable. You should be able to press on them, and they're spongy. You get a shunt that is stopped up, and they'll get hard as a rock because they're full of CSF fluid and they're under pressure. So you can just feel the shunt. It's right, usually right behind their ear, usually on their right side, but it's right behind the ear. Muscular dystrophy is another one. 
we usually see an onset of um, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy being one of those specific three to five years of age. It is a muscle weakening, weakness, and wasting. CP, cerebral palsy. We see a lot of pediatric patients with cerebral palsy. When we talk cerebral palsy, think about what's going on with the patient. They have poor muscle control. So they um, end up in a very, many times, a spastic state. They're always moving, they're always jerking. They, they have a hard time with coordinated control. So that's why they have a hard time with walking. They have a hard time sometimes with talking because it's coordinated. We have to coordinate vocal cord control. They have a hard time with control of the muscles. And so they have a very, um, con they're constantly moving. They have a constant uh, spasticity to them. What do you think that does for their caloric needs? It increases their caloric needs. What do you think that does for their body, typically their body frame, their body size? They're very thin. These patients are usually very thin, which makes sense if you think about cerebral palsy, if they're constantly moving and they have a hard time with muscle control, what does swallowing require? <laughs> muscle control. To, to swallow, they have to have that muscle control. So they have a hard time with that. Many times you'll see these patients with pegs. They'll have buttons um, so that we can get enough calories in them uh, for them to grow. You'll see them in braces. You'll see them um, in walkers. My mom was a special ed teacher for 45 years before she retired. Um, she was 35 in the state of Alabama and 10 in the state of Georgia. And she had a little boy, um, and his name was Tim. Timothy was his name. And he had CP. And I'm telling you, he could outrun you with a walker. Mm -hmm. Like, he was, you had to watch your toes. He would run over your feet. He had no qualms about if you got in his way he would run over you with that walker and he was the fastest thing with CP now he couldn't stand on his own but you could put him in his walker and you couldn't keep up with him um, but he had a very odd gait to his legs his toe his feet turned out and he pushed with the sides of his feet instead of that normal pattern that we have with walking they adapt very well with um, what kind of control they have now his CP was not as severe as others because he was able to walk. Many uh, children with CP are not able to walk. So um, they can get very stiff as well. They have a hard time with um, stretching. Stretching is a big part of their daily routines to keep mobility because they tend to be very tight. There are many times that they'll have surgeries to actually extend tendons um, so that they will have a, b a bigger range of motion, especially in the ankles and in the hips, so that they can walk. Um, they'll do, around the calves, they'll do um, tendon extensions. They'll cut them and expand them so that they have um, some flexibility and mobility in movement. got lots of different pictures in there with different types of CP. Again, we're not covering meningitis. We talked about meningitis with the adult. She still got the Brabinski and the Kerning sign both in there. It applies to children just like it does with adults. We still do LPs on children just like we do with adults. Um, We can still see encephalitis in children, and I think that kind of covers pediatrics. Um, so your big ones are things, look at things in the pediatric lecture that we haven't covered in the adult lecture. Look at your muscular dystrophy, look at your CP, look at your um, neural tube defects uh, for pediatrics. Questions about neuro.
lots of content. Spend some time in it, guys. I mean, do go watch some fireworks this weekend, but. Mm -hmm. You got time for all that now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're done with my seat. Going to a church and you're going to be like, spend too much time watching fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't watch fireworks, so you'll have to come do text review with me. Wow, How about that? <laughs> All right, y'all may go.